do the Q and A. To um, answer your question, Natalie, the this article has been accepted for publication, but it hasn't shown up yet. So it will be in the Journal of Visual Impairment and Blindness. I don't know sometime. <laughs> Very exciting. I will keep an eye on it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we have some time for questions here, and I see we have one hand up already. Okay, uh, let me stop sharing because I can't see. Okay, there, there we go. go. Okay, we can go to John. Just muted yourself again. Still muted. <laughs> there you go. Let's try that. Is that going to work? Yeah, it works. Okay. Thank, thanks for your presentation. I, I appreciate the the methodological problems that you cite of the various studies. Uh, but for those of us who do advocacy, as I do, uh, the press is very uh, frequently asks you how many of this or how many of that. And so while I understand you, you raise questions about the notion of 10%, do you and I also appreciate what you what you said, and I think it's a very valid comment that what the question the questions that are asked uh, very much impacts on the results you get, and that's the problem with any with, with, with any uh, quantitative study. But having said all that, if you have real questions about the ten percent, do you have a better a better guesstimate for us. Oh, I love that question. Um, I suspect you're not surprised to get it. <laughs> no, because, you know, and here's the thing, and well, several things. The first thing is, I think we're so used to having to give the elevator speech because people are, um, have what, I don't know, short attention spans, or they just want an answer. And, and I think sometimes what gets missed, what gets lost is nuance. And um, that sometimes the question doesn't doesn't um, lend itself to the elevator speech of um, you know thirty seven or whatever it is. I guess it was forty seven and the Hitchhiker's Guide. That, but uh, you know what what I tell people is um, something like um, you know it's difficult to know how many people. That there are who use Braille because um, we assume there's an undercount for, for many reasons. Um, what you do need to know is that Braille is absolutely essential and uh, needs to um, be, I mean, I don't care. This is my, my, I wouldn't say this to a reporter necessarily, but I mean, I would say to you guys, I don't care if there's only 10 Braille readers in the United States, they deserve to get Braille. <laughs> you know I, 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 agree, I agree with that too. Yeah. I so, agree with you. So I think, again, the, 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 the question is, or I'm sorry, the way to answer that is, you know, it's difficult to say how many because nobody's really counted, but I will tell you that um, there are thousands of people who rely on, um, on, on Braille for um, the, the immediacy, the, the independence, and the, the privacy that Braille allows them just the way print does to people who use print. I think we all agree with that, but then I can, can I try one more, see, can I try one more time to dig this answer out of you? Um, among, maybe, among, among friends here, what's your guess? I don't know. I honestly, I don't know. I not. I, if I could jump in, I just want to reinforce what, what you've said, Francis Mary. It's, it's so true. I was thinking the exact same thing that I think sometimes we get caught up on quantitative information and and in deciding whether something is important based on the number. And I mean, even if I were the only Braille reader in Canada, which clearly I'm not given how many we have to here today and even beyond today, even if that were the case, Braille would still be unquantifiable in terms of how important it is in my life. And I think, especially when you're talking about education, you have to look at each individual child or adult um, or senior, I have to say that, um, and, and decide if it's important for them. And if it is, then, uh, you know, um, you know, N equals one is good enough for me in that case. Right. Uh, I, see there's, uh, I, I see there's two more questions. I see Mark and TJ. And again, just looking at the time, so we only have a couple of minutes left, if that's okay. okay. Perfect. Yes, I think that's good. And we'll, we'll move on to the next person. Thank you, John, though, for your question. Yes. Mark? Very good question. 
you there. Thanks for that. I really appreciated the presentation. Super interesting. Um, my question, so I, I'll just respond quickly to the last one. I do think the value in knowing the number is then you can test whether interventions are having the impact that you want them to have, right? So there is some value in saying, okay, you know, and maybe it's not how many are there, but maybe how many have access to it that could benefit from it. Like you do need to answer those kinds of questions to know if putting more money in, changing the policies, hiring more teachers of the visually impaired, if that stuff is working yep. to get to the place you want to get. But so my question, so I'll put that on the table that I think there is, is some definite value in it. So then my question for you is, given that you've laid out a bunch of the complexities in the data that's already out there, do you in the paper propose suggestions for people who do want to measure this, right? So like we're part of organizations here in Canada, maybe some of us get together, we ask for some funding, we want to do this right. Uh, would, would your paper uh, or your group have advice for like how to do this the right way? Yeah, and I think that's really what our call to action is, which is um, that the, the use of consistent and clearly defined terms is really important. Um, and so, you, you know, even getting uh, these various agencies that are collecting data for policy reasons, for um, allocation of resources um, is um, important. And I think that's one of the reasons, you know, I'm, I'm not in adult services. My, my background's in, in education of, of children. Um, that's why it's just been so infuriating in the U.S. that we know that the federal government every year um, undercounts kids with visual impairments. We know it, we have it documented, we, but without having a mandate to actually collect the information in a consistent and clear way, it's just not gonna happen. States don't have the resources to, to, to do it and some states do it just for, uh, anyway. So I think that the first step is to make sure that everybody's asking the questions in the right way. And somebody made the comment um, um, about, well, why do we even ask the question? Because we don't ask how many print readers there are. We, what we, in, in the United States at least, there are, for adults, there are um, uh, collections of uh, literacy rates th that don't have a yes, no, they're not binary questions. They're at what level of um, reading um, proficiency people are for, for print readers. Um, so, so some people do kind of collect that information. Uh, we don't collect that anything. Uh, uh, consistently for, for Braille readers at all. Um, but I think the, the point is well taken that if we really um, need that information to make sure we're providing good services, then we have to be very clear about collecting the information in a consistent um, and clear way. And that means not having one person ask the question about what one of the surveys was, um, that collected information about visual impairment was something like, um, can you recognize a friend from across the street? Well, what does that tell you? Do, do you know what I mean? So unless everybody is asking that question in a consistent way, we're gonna get just these wild, weird answers all the time. And then we won't know um, uh, whether or not we're providing the amount of resources that are required. And so, I'm sorry, I'm going. Well, I, think, to... <laughs> I think I think we have time for just one more quick question, and then we'll take our break before the, the next presentation. I think it's uh, is it Tracy? This is TJ Evans. TJ, you're still there. We go. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm working screen reader here, so I had to turn it back on and. And get it activated. Get the thing unmuted. Um, for we understand things are very mixed up when it comes to that those type of stats and that being taken in the states. Um, now it would probably even be more mixed up because we're even worse at taking records up here in that <laughs> aspect. It's um, hard to believe, but I'll take uh, yeah, I know it is hard to believe. We, but I mean, even our legislation, our our disability legislation, is a joke. Um, right i mean you guys got it a lot better in the states when it comes to that than we do and it's still not great down there <laughs> um i guess my question is 
uh, I I guess you probably already kind of answered it, but it's just like what what is, what hints to be able to talk to these people, to be able to talk to these government entities that don't seem to want to put the type of resources in because they don't think it's necessary. Right. Um, I don't know. Do, do you have any type of uh, uh, guidance or anything on that one, or any type of hints? Or right. So I think that was um, um, as I started saying, um, it is related to what do we need that answer for, and if it is, um, f- as as Mark was just saying that. We're trying to collect information, so we want to make sure that we have enough resources available. Then, uh, um, again, there may be multiple ways of determining what a braille literacy rate is, but for for different purposes. So, for example, it may be um, um, a a way of more accurately collecting information for um, for children to make sure that instructional material centers um, are getting um, the resources they need for providing um, braille materials. and that might be different for folks who are working with, with adults. Um, so, well, my girlfriend actually works with uh, adults, and while well, so do I. We work for a training center up here. Mm-hmm. Um, Aaron, say hi. Hi. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but it, and that's part of it is is having those stats in things so we can get the resources for the the learners and for the braille literature and materials and, that. and then also even for the aspect for accessible library they've already tried to cut our accessible library that's right yeah. right and so it really does behoove us to be you know, strong advocates for the importance of Braille. And as I said, it doesn't matter if it's 100 or 100,000 um, people who rely on Braille, um, you know, need to have access to uh, high quality materials. And, um, <clears throat> you know, the fact that it, it kind of tickled me knowing even that, you know, the Matilda Ziegler magazine, which was just, you know, a privately funded um, um project through the Matilda Ziegler Foundation was providing their magazine in New York Point into the 60s, 30 years after, <laughs> you know, English Braille American Edition was actually the, the code because they understood that people relied on it and they wanted to get materials in their, um, in their medium. And I, I just, I think that that says a lot about how people understand how important reading is. This is what Kay started us talking about is how important reading is to people. That's really and I remember, I remember, sorry to interrupt, but I, I remember quite clearly reading Matilda Ziegler magazines when I was a kid in, in Braille and, and loving the articles in them and also 17 and stuff yeah. like that. So. Yeah. I think that's going to be the theme today. Well, thanks very much, Francis okay. Mary, for your thanks wonderful for presentation. Yes, um, you. We've had a lot of good discussion, and uh, we'll take our break now for about 10 minutes or so, and we should be starting up with our next presentation at uh, 3 o'clock Eastern. <laughs>